Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 581 of Saints and Cynics. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am apologetic that it took me so long to get this together. I first thought we were going to do one book and then changed my mind on a dime, which, you know, happens to all of us at some point. But I think most of the time does not result in quite the flurry of research that this decision required. I have been inside the four-inch thick volume of Mark Twain's autobiography, volume one, that was sent to me years ago by a listener, which I so appreciate. For one thing, it's just marvelous. And for another thing, hugely helpful. A three-inch thick book of Mark Twain quotations that turned out not to be that useful. The two-and-a-half-inch, almost three-inch thick version of the book that we're about to read, and there's a reason why it is so thick, which I will explain in a minute. Another book that's only about, you know, an inch and a quarter thick on the Angelfish Club, which we will also talk about shortly. I had to <laughs> I had to put them in another room so that I wouldn't read you entire passages out of all of these books, because it's so fascinating what we are about to dive into, and so unlike anything else I've done on Craftlet. Oh, and that, that doesn't count all, all of the many articles, journal articles, research articles, scholarly articles that I found citations for and then sent to my poor sister in Berlin and said, hey, at your university, can you get any of these? Because evidently my access as an alum of UCLA doesn't actually get me off-campus library journal-style access. I was able to look up and find the citations, but not actually access the articles. I'm not bitter about that at all. You can tell. Oh, but Craftlit. Hi there. If you're new to Craftlit, welcome. You have landed amongst the best people in the podcast world. You'll hear me in old episodes say it before many, many times, and I'll say it again. Craftlit people are just better. There's something about people who create and make, and there are all different kinds of makers here. Knitters, spinners, dyers, gardeners, jewelry makers, quilters. It goes on and on and on, all of the many, many different things that people who listen to this show make. Some of them make mathematical equations, and some of them make scientific experiments, and Everybody I have ever met who has listened to this podcast has turned out to be fascinating and fun and smart. And I just love all y'all is what it comes down to. But how does it work? If you already know how Craftlet works, where you can find it, how you can support it, and all that good stuff, please skip ahead to about 11 and a half minutes or so, or maybe 12 and a half minutes and uh, pick up Twain there. So again, how does Craftlit work? Well, Craftlit as a podcast has been around so long, since 2006, that it's gone through several different iterations of where it's located on the internet and show notes and all this stuff. The things that haven't changed. Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N, has been the host of the Craftlit podcast feed since day one. So craftlit.libsyn.com is a place where you can get access to the episodes always. That site has never gone down. It has never suffered any of the problems that iTunes has suffered in the past, never suffered any of the problems that craftlit.com has suffered in the past. So craftlit.libsyn.com, always safe for you to find episodes at. Libsyn also, wow, about a decade ago, came to me and said, hey, you've been a podcaster with us for a long time. We are 
starting to put together an app, would you be interested in being a beta run? And I said, uh, yeah. So back in the day before anybody had apps, Craftlet did. And that app can get you access to all of the free episodes. It has a little search bar. You can search for uh, episodes. It's usually easiest by number. It's not the best search bar ever. And then in the extras section, there is a PDF that includes the library of Craftlet. And so you can look up and see, okay, well, what number episode does Little Women start at? And you can find your way to the book that way. You can also support the show a couple of different ways. One is on that Craftlet app. You can go to craftlet.libsyn.com and there will be a banner at the top that mentions premium access that gets you access to the just the books versions of Craftlet. I did for several years when I didn't have another job, I did two podcasts a week, one that was Craftlet and one that was just the books with the notes and no crafty chat or anything extraneous. Those books then became the premium feed that was accessible both on the app at Lipson, craftlet.lipson.com and on Patreon. And to access those on the app, you go to settings. Upper left corner, there's a little menu icon. Tap on that at the bottom of that menu. In settings, you can sign in to your premium account that you set up on the web at craftlet.lipson.com. And some of those books I bundled and re-released as standalone downloads, and those are accessible at craftlit.gumroad.gum, as in Mary, R-O-A-D as in dog, dot com. And some of them are free. Some of them are listed as pay what you like, however much you think it's worth. Go ahead and put that amount in and get access to the book. And some of them have set prices on them. I think that's everything about where you can get access to all of the previous episodes, all 580 foie, previous episodes. And your support for the show is what has made it possible for me to keep doing this. It's gotten less and less cheap to, <laughs> to maintain this the more procasters there are in the field or radio shows that release their episodes as podcasts. It has made it considerably less easy for little people like me to keep doing this. So I really do very much appreciate the support that you have offered to me and to all of the books that we've done. I really, I really do appreciate it. And then during the, the year that wasn't, or the years that weren't, 20 and 21, I started boy, was it April of 20 that we started doing Tuesday morning, Eastern time, 5 a.m.? Yes, 5 a.m., Tuesday morning, Eastern time. Uh, we have a Zoom chat. So people who do not live in the United States have a chance to meet some people who do, who listen to Craftlet, including me, and always Tracy, who is my savior when it comes to the, the Zoom chats. And then Thursday night, Eastern time, 7 p.m., we have the other chat. And you are all welcome to join anytime you can. As you might imagine, after almost two years of meeting weekly, we are a chatty bunch. And it can take some doing to get yourself folded into the conversation. But please, please, please show up. Mention books you are reading or things you are making in the chat. That way we know that you are there and, you know, not just listening and hanging out, but have something you want to show and share because the rest of us who've been doing this for two years now will break in and talk on top of each other pretty easily, <laughs> which is, I know, much harder to do if you haven't been there before. But please, please, please push your way in. As I said before, Craftlet people are just wonderful and always, always happy to welcome new people and meet you and find out cool things about you too. So. The weirdest thing about these Zoom chats that we do is that the way you get access to it is by registering by email. That way, if something goes horribly, horribly wrong, we can email everybody. But the other side of that is that it looks like it's providing you with a limited time link. 
to a particular Zoom room, but that's kind of not true. I've been renewing the length of time that that Zoom room is available for. And as a consequence, if you have ever registered for the Tuesday or Thursday meetup, that link is still working and will continue to forever. Even if I don't renew the amount of time that's left on it, you'll still be able to join in on the old original link. The links to all of those things will be found in the show notes at craftlit.libson.com, episode 581, or in theory, because the guys I paid to rebuild the website seem to have broken a fundamental part of it. So I am not sure right now if you can get this episode at craftlit.com slash 581 or craftlit.com slash episodes slash 581. I'm trying to get them to fix it. We'll see. But Mark Twain, that's what we're here for. Because let's see, we did some Twain short story-ness way back in the day in 2006. I can't even remember if I had a headphone microphone at that point. It's so long ago. And I'm sure the audio quality is just garbage. But then after that, several years after that, we did a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. I have never lost so many listeners over a book as I did with Connecticut Yankee. I knew it was risky. Twain is hard to do. I still stand by it, though. It's an amazing piece of genius. Joan of Arc reared its head during that time. And I believe I even mentioned it on the podcast because the guy who read the Connecticut Yankee also read Joan of Arc. And I love his voice. I love his voice as Twain. And as a consequence, I was like, ooh, I'm going to listen to anything that this guy recorded. And then I saw Mark Twain's personal recollections of Joan of Arc. And I was intrigued and I listened to it. And I believe I said on the podcast at the time that at some point in the future, we would wind up doing this book because I found it so haunting and beautiful. And I knew there was a backstory there, but I didn't know what it was. And I'm really, really glad I waited until now. Having 16, what is it, 16 years, 17, almost 17 years of doing this podcast under my belt, I feel a little more capable of tackling this because it has it has been something that needed tackling. I am looking at, I am not kidding, a two and a half foot by two and a half foot artboard that I have connected and rubber banded and clipped giant sheets of newsprint to, you know, just blank pages that I've written all over. Andrew came downstairs and looked at it and said, wow, do I need to get you some red string and thumbtacks? And when I showed it to Aaron on Zoom, Aaron's response was, wow, mom, you made a conspiracy theory board. And that is, in fact, exactly what this looks like. The provenance of this story was so complicated. And the layers of uh, both meaning, but also Twain himself, Twain's history, is so layered into the context of bringing this book to life and both the why the book came to life and also the why it was written this way. There are many moving pieces, and I know I am going to forget things. I have probably already forgotten things that I should bring up in this pretext episode, but I'm just going to have to stuff them in later because there's, there's a lot, and it's good, and it's beautiful. And as I said in the little preview before, right now I could use a little good and beautiful, even if it makes me cry in the end. Mark Twain, too, needed some hope in humanity. And this is the book he wrote to provide himself that. And I, I can't think of a better time to do that. So Mark Twain. Mark Twain is a complicated person. And I really do mean that. There are lots of competing tensions in his life. Kind of like if you take a really strong rubber band and you hold it in your hands and you pull it like you're doing chest expansions and it's a really good rubber band and you can feel that tension as you're pulling the rubber band side to side. That's kind of what his whole 
everything is like. The more I'm reading about him, the more I'm realizing this. But sometimes he's also put that rubber band around the back of his neck. So he's actually pulling down and apart with his hands and creating this kind of triangular tension. There's a lot going on inside Mark Twain. He was born November 30th, 1835. Halley's Comet was in the sky. He died April 21st, 1910. Halley's Comet was in the sky. He predicted he would come in with the comet and go out with the comet. Well, he didn't predict that he would go in with the comet. He came in with the comet, and then he predicted he'd go out with the comet when it came back, and he was right. There are lots of stories of prescient statements made by him and by Joan that were proven true. So that's kind of weird because it's not often that predictive moments like that actually are borne out in real life. So that's kind of cool. What wasn't so cool is that the last 15 years of Mark Twain's life were hard. He and his wife, Livy, Olivia, had already lost their first child, a son, Langdon, and when he was two years old, and they lost him to diphtheria, because there's a reason why we have diphtheria shots for children. Diphtheria killed lots of children. So here's one of those instances. Two years later, the same year that their son died, they had their son, uh, they had their son, they had their daughter, Susie. Susie was his first and oldest daughter of three. She was born in 1872. Clara was born in 1874, and Jean was born in 1880. Now, Jean had epilepsy, and that is what eventually killed her. She drowned in the bathtub, assumedly after having a, an epileptic fit, and that happened in 1909. But tragically, his oldest daughter, Susie, she died of meningitis. She was 23 years old, I think almost almost 24, maybe just to turn 24. And she passed away in 1896. So that was kind of the beginning of the end. And then not terribly long after that, I believe it was 1904, when Twain is 69 years old, Olivia died. They were in Italy at the time because the doctor said she needed to go someplace warm and light for her health and didn't work. I mean, it helped some. It staved it off for a little while. So by the end, he had Clara left. And Clara and he had a tense relationship. Clara was also a performer. She's a contralto, and she had an actually pretty epic singing career. And the time that they spent in Europe, which was partially for not, not exactly tax evasion, but kind of for tax evasion, because Twain was really bad with money. Clara spent a lot of her formative years in Europe and was attached to a lot of European musicians. She married two the first one passed away and then she remarried a different guy. She has a biography all her own. But she and her dad didn't really see eye to eye. She had kind of European sensibilities. And I mean that in exactly the way it sounds, that there's a lot of Gilded Age propriety going on around Clara and not so much going on around Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. So it may seem obvious, oh, well, if that's what his last 15 years or so are like, well, of course he wrote a book that's hopeful, about a hopeful character like Joan. And that's true, but that's not the whole story. That's missing the entire story of what was going on in society. Not unlike today, there was a lot of nostalgia talk. This was the fin de siècle. This was the end of the century, the end of an era uh, in the 1890s, a lot was changing. A lot had already changed. And it felt like life was speeding up too fast. So there was a lot of nostalgia talk about slower, more pastoral childhoods that was going on. At the same time, of course, there were some marvelous new inventions and ways of living that were wonderful, that were time savers, that were making life safer. There were others that were making life more dangerous as well. But, and I am going to read you a quotation from Albert Stone's article he wrote in 1959 on Joan of Arc. He pointed out that part of the 1890s for at least a, a large chunk of American society was this, they were wrestling with this nostalgia for a childhood free from a loss of faith and 
crippling scientific determinism, along with industrialization, imperialism, and a worship of wealth. Scientific determinism, to put it very, very simply and briefly, I mean really simplifying it too much, said that basically we can understand through science how everything works. We can predict accurately human behavior. And because of that, there is no such thing as free will. Everything is predestined. And not predestined in a kind of mystical, religious way, but predestined in a hard, factual, scientific way. And that's considerably different. And we know from Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer and a lot of his more ebullient travelogues and tall tales, he was a humorist. He also had kind of a, a passion relationship with boisterous childhood tale telling. There is just, you can tell there is this love of story. And that was absolutely true. And I don't think that really ever changed. If he had an audience, he could still go there even in those last 15 years. But there's no question that this tension between a childhood free from a, a loss of faith versus this scientific determinism downer that everybody's talking about, also combined with his innate skepticism. Like he grew up in a world that was largely religious and superstitious, but he was very much a skeptic. He hated hypocrisy anytime he found it. That's what a lot of his books are about. Somewhere in there, there are characters who are hypocritical who can be ridiculed. Huck Finn is like one long essay on that. And sadly, Huck's decision at the end is to get away from society. There is no society that isn't corrupted and hypocritical and bad. So he lights out for the territories. He, he runs west to get as far away from people as he can. And you can see that growing feeling in Twain from the time he wrote Huck Finn on. And Huck Finn was in 1885, so 20 years after the Civil War ended. But Twain also, because he was raised in a religious environment and a superstitious environment, he wound up marrying a woman for whom religion was very important. He was raised Presbyterian himself. He raised his children with religion in the home. They went to church. But he, he had a, a love-hate relationship. One of the articles I read said he, he had a jilted love affair with religion. He wanted to believe, but where he wound up was closer to like the Jefferson Bible version of the New Testament. He didn't really like the miracles. He didn't like anything that smacked of fake or fakery or superstition or good, kind, simple people being played. He didn't like that. And what it wound up growing into was that he didn't so much have a problem with religion. He had a problem with religious organizations because they inevitably became political. And that's where his problems with them really started. So it's, it's easy to say, well, he was anti-religious, but that's really not true. He's kind of agnostic in his view of religion itself and kind of more of a, actually kind of more of a deist, like a lot of the founding fathers were, that of course there was a God. That kind of goes without saying, but... God isn't actively involved in our lives, interceding and things like that. He's kind of like a clockmaker who wound up the clock and set it running and is just watching the clock go. So you have a man who wanted to believe, but he couldn't believe. You have a guy who is wrestling with these memories of his childhood, very likely putting them on a pedestal, but he had spent a lifetime doing that in his stories. Like there's a lot of Tom Sawyer that has a, almost a one-to-one -one correspondence with things that he saw in his childhood, stories he heard in his childhood, places he was in his childhood. So there's a very solid connection there about him remembering youth and, of course, the, the vigor of youth as well as a net positive. And in fact, when his daughter Susie was young, one of the things that they did, they were living, I think at that time they were living in Connecticut, they moved a lot because of money problems. He was not good with money at all. And in fact, just got lucky that towards the end of his life, he basically had a friend take over his finances. And thank God, because he would have died destitute otherwise. 
I'm pretty comfortable saying that he was not headed to a good place financially. But he, I think they were in Connecticut, and every Saturday morning, Susie's friends would come over. So there was like a porch full of children, and he would read to them drafts of his next story or tell them stories that would become his next story. Uh, I believe he was writing The Prince and the Pauper during most of this time, and he would read the drafts and, and get feedback from them, all these little girls. So he's writing stories predominantly about boys because he was one, but he is getting his editorial responses from his wife, his daughters, and Susie was quite a good writer of her own, and uh, as was his wife, and then all of these girls who hung out at the house because he was like the ideal grandfather. He didn't just tell you back when I was a child and we had to walk both ways uphill to and from school. He didn't do that. He was telling stories that were fun and exciting and funny. And he loved making them laugh. He loved performing. Obviously, he's that American version of Charles Dickens. The, the lecture tours, the Hal Holbrook version of Mark Twain was absolutely real. Give the man an audience and he perked right up. So you can imagine after Susie died and after Livy died, his daughter Jean was in and out of sanatoriums, unhappily so. She was begging family to come and stay with her and visit her, and they largely didn't. Clara is in Europe becoming a famous singer and touring herself, and Twain got lucky. He wound up finding a young man who was so impressed, not enamored of, not a fan of in any kind of like fangirl way, but just like really got Mark Twain, who said, I want to write your biography. And Twain's response was, when do you want to start? And so this guy would show up and Twain did not get out of bed until after noon every day at this point in his life. So he'd be sitting in his bed propped up on the pillows with his lap desk on his lap, doing his correspondence in the morning. And, and he's in his nightshirt. And this guy, Payne, would come over and basically take dictation for years, like almost 20 years of this. He was a mainstay. And then during that same time, a woman, uh, Isabel Lyon, L-Y-O-N-S, I think, she became his kind of house manager. And I mean that both in the theatrical sense and in an Edwardian upstairs, downstairs sense that she she pretty much ran his life. And then there was another guy, Ashcroft, who was his business manager, his financial friend. These three people really allowed him to flourish. The only times that he was flourishing in those last 15 years was because they were there protecting him. But one of the other things they did is they were there and participants in what became his aquarium. And you may have heard of this before. I don't remember if I talked about this 10 years ago when we did Connecticut Yankee. I knew about it at the time because the book had been published earlier. But Mark Twain had a club for about six years during, during that last stretch of his life. So you have to remember, his health is not great. It's not bad yet, but he's, I mean, he's an old man. and. He smoked all the time and he drank a lot. And he, he loved telling stories that were fun and especially fun stories about being young. And it's very hard to look at this part of his life through 19th century eyes. So I need you to go back in time with me. First, the Aquarium Club did not meet without chaperones. Payne, Ashcroft, Lyons were almost always there. At least one of them was always there when the Aquarium Club met. And the Aquarium Club met sometimes all together, but more often one or two of the angelfish in the aquarium would come and stay at the house, often with family members. This wasn't Lewis Carroll. This wasn't Michael Jackson. This was a man who understood propriety, who very, very desperately needed to be a grandfather. And that wasn't going to happen on his own. And he was very happy that he got to pick his own granddaughters. I think part of what was happening was that he was looking for a replacement for Susie. 
the daughter who he lost. And part of it was just he needed an adoring fan base. And adults have other pressing issues that they have to deal with. Children do not. So he was very, very specific. The girls were between the ages of 10 and 16. When you turned 16, you were no longer an angelfish. That was, you were crossing a line, and it was a line he didn't want to think about. He only collected, and I'm using that word against my better judgment because it sounds so wrong, but it's also so accurate. The girls he collected, the girls he invited to be angelfish were girls who were feisty and physically and intellectually feisty, smart, well-bred, largely came from money, went to private schools, many of them boarding schools. Their parents knew who Mark Twain was and were also fans. Clearly, the girls had been able to and allowed to read his books. And they were innocent in a way that goes beyond just sexually innocent. They were innocent in that they didn't wrestle with doubt. They knew what they knew. They knew he was funny in the way that only a kid can do. They made ridiculous declarations, you know, that like they knew everything in the world. It's, I think, where Mark Twain's quote, when I was 13, I couldn't believe what an idiot my father was. And when I was seven years later, I couldn't believe how much he'd learned. It's the same kind of thing. These children were gregarious and fearless. And that lines up with his memory of childhood as well. So the thing that kept him going for a lot of those last 15 years were these girls. And the, the correspondence between them is hilarious, for one thing. And for another thing, the girls were hysterical, too. It wasn't just Mark Twain being funny. He kept calling one of them in an early letter, sweet and dear. And she said in a letter back to him, I had wanted to call you sweet or dear, but I was pretty sure you'd taken out a copyright on those words. This was an 11-year-old girl. <laughs> and I mean, you can see this was, a, this was an uncommon man and an uncommon group of young people who he surrounded himself with. He was also very, very aware about the dichotomy between how women were raised and how men were raised. And that actually comes up pretty clearly in some of his marginalia notes about Joan of Arc, which we'll talk about a little later. So you've got Mark Twain. You've got the fact that he only really had daughters. And Langdon only lasted two years, which is heartbreaking because he was a person. But he raised daughters. He loved the energy of smart young girls. He loved stories of childhood and adventure. And he was really funny. So you put all of those together at the end of the century. And I'm sorry, you don't get Joan of Arc. And that's because there was a piece missing. And this was the piece. When I was a young boy, maybe 12 or 13 in Hannibal, Missouri, a wayward page from a tattered book once flew across my path as I made my way home from a shift as an apprentice for a local printer. For reasons beyond my understanding, I felt compelled to snatch the loose paper from the air. Reading down the page, I stopped in my tracks. Then I sat down on the ground where I devoured every word. The scene captured on that errant page was a piquant one. It told of a young French girl caught in a desperate debate with a pair of English rogues. The girl was caged and wearing nothing but crude undergarments. The brutes who had stolen her clothes were doing their best to rile their prisoner, but to little avail. There arose in me a deep compassion for the gentle maid of Orléans, a burning resentment toward her captors, and a powerful and indestructible interest in her sad story. I ran home and immediately began questioning my family about what on earth this mysterious heroine might have possibly done to be imprisoned within a cage. My family, unsurprisingly, knew little of the girl, but regardless, by the end of the night, my mind had been captured by this brave girl. It was an interest that would grow steadily for more than half a lifetime and culminate at last in my crowning work, The Personal Reflections of Joan of Arc, 
what I hope will be known as the loveliest and lovingest story ever told of that martyred girl. I think I could write a pretty strong argument in favor of female suffrage, but I did not want to do it. I never want to see the women voting and gabbling about politics and electioneering. There is something revolting in that thought. It would shock me inexpressibly for an angel to come down from above and ask me to take a drink with him, though I should doubtless consent. But it would shock me still more to see one of our blessed earthly angels peddling election tickets among a mob of shabby scoundrels she never saw before. That story sounds kind of fantastical. It sounds tall tale-like, which, from the man who wrote The Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, you could expect, right? That this is something he made up in retrospect. It's not. And not only is it not, but one of the researchers went back to one of the, I don't know, 15 books that Twain read while he was preparing to write Joan of Arc, books that Many of them are still in his in his library, his papers that are at Cal Berkeley. And the marginalia in the notes on these books is sometimes written in French by him, because the book is written in French, and sometimes written in English. But one of the things that one of the researchers figured out is there is a page from, I think it's the 1845 printing of the book by Michelet. He's one of the authors of a book of the history of Joan of Arc. There is a page in that printing, which is the printing Twain would have seen when this story happened to him in 1852. There is a page that lines up with his story. It has that dialogue between the captors and Joan. So this is probably true. And that's just the first of the, wow, really? stories about this thing. So at that time, Joan wasn't really talked about a whole lot, certainly not in America, certainly not anywhere near the South. And even though he was in Missouri, it was still uh, Southern-esque. And as we've talked before on the podcast, South in America at this time and Catholicism in America at this time, not real good friends. So he wouldn't have had a whole range of opportunity to learn more about Joan of Arc as a kid. But then he goes to Europe, and then he's closer to France. And they lived in several different cities in and around. But he went into Paris several times to get access to the historical records of Joan of Arc's trials. There's the original trial that condemned her, or a series of trials that condemned her. And then there's the trial of rehabilitation, which her mother started years, decades, after Joan had been burned at the stake. Joan's mother finally got the church to rescind its condemnation of her. I mean, fat lot of good it did for Joan at that point, but it did resurrect her image. And in both of the series of trials in the beginning and the, the one at the end that, that kind of brought her back, there are court records, there are transcripts, there's testimonial transcripts, there are depositions, there are quotes from people on the stand sworn to tell the truth, and we have all those records. And Twain commented on that, that unlike a lot of history, which is written by the victors, and he was well aware of that and hated imperialism, there is a unique opportunity with Joan of Arc to, first off, hear Joan speaking, because they transcribed what she was saying too, but also hear what people who grew up with her said, and people who served with her, and people who had known her her entire 17 years. And you don't see that. Twain says anywhere else in history, and I would say prior to the year 1900, that's really pretty true. It's a really unique opportunity that he took advantage of for all of the best reasons. Now, because Twain had never undertaken anything remotely like this, he spent 12 years researching Joan of Arc, making notes, putting the story together. And the book winds up breaking down into three parts. There's the pre- Joan of Arc, Joan, so that's childhood. And then there's the Joan in the field, Joan as the leader, Joan, that's book two. And then there's book three, which is the trial. He took facts from the depositions of people who knew Joan as a child, and he put those into book one. And he 
absolutely twainified it. The kids sound like Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. There is nothing French about them, aside from their names in the beginning. And that's fine. That's Twain being Twain. That was how he knew how to tell a story of childhood and imbue it with that kind of mystical beauty that childhood still, this kind of sparkling nature of being young that Twain was clearly jonesing for at the time. And then for the second book, when she's in the field, he also took a lot of that from testimony. So that that has a little bit more actual history-ness vibe to it. There are a lot of actual real people who show up in book two. So you've gone from family and childhood. And Twain kind of pastoralized her childhood in a way that wasn't entirely accurate. He accused a lot of other people of turning her into kind of a dumpy peasant girl. In fact, I think he was talking about the painter who painted the Joan of Arc in the Met Museum in New York City that I love. But I can, I can see what he means. I disagree with him wholeheartedly because I find that painting to be utterly beautiful and heartbreaking. But I get what he's saying. But it, Joan was not poor. Her family was actually doing pretty well. And the home that she was born in is still there. So it wasn't like she was born in a shack. She wasn't out milking the cows. She also wasn't educated like boys would have been. So there's some reality in all of that. But then the third book. The third book is where Twain knew he had to pull out every stop he possibly could because that needed to be accurate and true. And lucky for him, it was about as dramatic as a courtroom scene can be. He outfinches Atticus Finch throwing the glass to Tom Robinson. It is extraordinary. And I think it was in those court transcripts that Twain really, truly fell in love with Joan. Because there, there are both sections about how she behaved in chains, in prison, with the guards who were just SOBs. And there were also extraordinary moments from the court where these learned guys who were prosecuting her kept trying to trip her up and ask her questions, you know, the same question they asked the day before, but just a little bit differently. And she started turning to the court stenographer and saying, could you read back my answer from yesterday, please? Because she knew better than to try and answer it any differently than she did before. She's a really, really smart cookie. And you know Twain had to just love that and eat it up. But the other thing about her, going back to that childhood, youthful inability to doubt, doubt their own decisions, doubt the reality that they see in front of them, doubt their rightness. Joan absolutely embodies that. She is what he called indestructibly innocent. And again, this isn't a sexual innocence. This is an incorruptibility. It's an incorruptible childhood potential for good. And she didn't live long enough to disappoint anybody on that front. We have such a schism in society, and it's all over the world right now. We have put ourselves into this dualistic world where there's only my point of view and your point of view. There's only right and wrong. We are very, very tangibly in a world where a lot of the people who are talking the loudest are incapable of doubt and questioning. And the problem with that is that we see with Joan of Arc where that leads. If you take somebody who is that sure of themselves, that incapable of doubt, that childlike in their view of things, you get a war. At the same time, Joan didn't kill anyone. She's very clear on that. She would raise her sword. She had a sword, partially to protect herself. But she, she had a sword. She would raise her sword. But during battles, she put her sword away so that she wouldn't accidentally kill someone. At the same time, she was responsible for a lot of people dying. So you have, again, this very interesting tension going on between Twain and his world, between Joan and her world, between the 
the 500 years that separated the two of them. And then you have us. And we've, we have gotten so cynical, like Twain, where he, he despised mankind, but he loved individuals. There's a lot of that going around right now. But because of that, I worry that it's going to be hard for us to listen to this book in a way that opens us up to the belief that there could be a, a simple joy, a simple grace in life, that it is possible to have been a leader and be indestructibly innocent and be incorruptible. I have to believe that most people who get involved in politics start with the, I'm going to go do good. I'm going to be the incorruptible one. I'm going to be the one who stands up for right and does right for others. And then I have a sneaking suspicion that by the time they get there and get involved and get into the weeds, it becomes more of instead of I'm going to do good, it becomes I'm going to make sure no more harm is done. Because it's the difference between the children's world and the adult world. The adult world is full of doubt and uncomfortable decisions and circumstances that we can't control and systems that break people, but because it's a system, we can't fix it on our own. In a kid's world, that's not true. And in Joan's world, it wasn't true. And Joan acted on that. She rescued France from being irrevocably broken. The Hundred Years' War ended because of Joan of Arc. And that's pretty impressive. And it was certainly impressive to Mark Twain. I'm going to play you one last clip. And this one is a, about Twain 10 years after the book's been out. And it was not well received by the public. I mean, it was certainly less well received during the 20th century. Scholars do not know how to deal with this book. I don't understand that. I guess they didn't read the same books I did. I don't know. I don't know why people who have studied Mark Twain's texts find this to be such an aberration, but they do. And it, it wasn't very well received back in the day either. Twain's friends got it. Literary critics of the time kind of didn't. At the same time, within a decade of him having written the book, Joan's Beatification happened. And then within, what, 15 years of him writing the book, she was sainted. So clearly somebody was listening and paying attention, even though Twain was not okay with the nationalism, the kind of nationalistic pride. He was very uncomfortable with that, which says a lot about him. And he wasn't okay with the churchiness of the story. He found the Catholic church officials who killed her to be morally reprehensible all over the place. He is not a huge fan. At the same time, he only used pro-French sources, Armagnac sources. He didn't read any texts on the Burgundian side, on the, the Henry V, on the British side. So again, he's just such an interesting dichotomy of stances and thoughts. And I think he worked them out in his books. Either way, this last clip that I'm going to play you tells you a little bit about the impact that Joan had on him in his soul and in his heart. And this was nine years after he wrote the book, after he published it, 10 years after he started publishing it as a serial in Harper's Magazine. All right, here's the clip. On a December night in 1905, the New York City chapter of the Society of Illustrators managed to do something many thought impossible. With one calculated stroke, they left Mark Twain, author and noted quipster, speechless. The writer had just risen to address the group. As he began to speak, a girl emerged from the back of the room. Her hair was cropped just below the ears. Her face was angular but radiant. Underneath a ceremonial white robe, she wore the armor of a 15th century French soldier. With eyes fixed on the author, she glided up the aisle between the tables, carrying a laurel wreath atop a satin pillow. A reporter from the New York Times in attendance that night later wrote that the company smile Twain had exhibited for most of the ceremony faded. 
by the time the girl reached his table. Twain had every appearance of a man who had seen a ghost. His eyes fairly started out of his head. His hand gripped the edge of the table. She presented the author with a wreath, and he accepted it wordlessly. He remained silent until the model exited the room. As the seconds ticked away, Twain's audience anxiously awaited his response. When the writer finally spoke, he did so slowly, carefully. Now there's an illustration, gentlemen, a real illustration. I studied that girl, Joan of Arc, for 12 years, and it never seemed to me that the artists and the writers gave us a true picture of her. They drew a picture of a peasant. Her dress was that of a peasant, but they always missed the face, the divine soul, the pure character, the supreme woman, the wonderful girl. She was only 18 years old, but put into a breast like hers, a heart like hers, and I think, gentlemen, you would have a girl like that. So yeah, I had my dad read those clips. <laughs> I couldn't think of a better person to read that for you than my dad, because as a kid, my dad read Roughing It to us, which was a lot of fun and a good read. Okay, that was a lot. That was complicated. That was longer than most of the episodes are going to be. Thank you for sticking with me through all of that. We're going to have some chapters that are just as complicated because a lot's going on in them. But I hope you're intrigued. And I hope you're willing to go on this journey with me. It is, as we have said, not a perfect book, but it sure is an interesting one. And one that is all love. On the, the writing side, obviously unloving things happen to Joan, certainly in book three. But the, the writing of it, the impetus for writing it, it's all love. And love for her. And what she did. And how brave she was. And one of the things Twain said in his own article in Harper's Magazine in 1904, after the book had been out for almost 10 years, was that she didn't even have the benefit of what boys got in their kind of tacit education, which is that boys can't be cowards. Only girls can be cowards. Boys can't be. And he said, even with all of the things that were stacked against her, even to that, she never had anyone tell her, you can be brave. She was massively, indestructibly brave. It's extraordinary. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for rolling along with me, this book. And if you want to roll along with me in another way, check out the link in the show notes to uh, look at the trip to Ireland that we will be going on this fall. It was supposed to be last fall, but you know, that was the year that wasn't, or one of the two years that wasn't. So we'll, we'll do it this year. And I will be sharing uh, bits and pieces and information about that trip as we continue through Joan of Arc. And uh, links to everything I've talked about are in the show notes. And that's it. Take care. Have a great one. Be well. Take care of each other. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>